Mr. Yang, Professor Choi, uh, Wake, uh, my fellow uh, scientists and educators, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, let me thank the Young Academy of Science, uh, Hong Kong, inviting me to give something, to talk about something which I'm not so familiar with. Well, as you have heard, I mean, I'm a physicist and have just rather recently, compared with my age, uh, transformed into someone who is uh, doing education. And I'm supposed to talk about some of our experience. And uh, at the last moment, I turned out to, to, to turn my title into a little bit more, uh, more uh, modest, which is actually telling you what uh, uh, some two challenges that we are trying to address when we are educating the young generation of, uh, of leaders. Yeah, this is the first challenge that we are thinking. Well, actually, this is something which I think most of you, most of the educator in Hong Kong or worldwide, has been witnessing. That um, well, uh, there's something called the 21st century skills, which uh, everyone is talking about. And actually, well, basically, what it's emphasizing is that somehow the we have to nurture our our young generation of students some new skills that are not taught in traditional classroom. For example, this is something which I think most of us have heard about the 4C. Creativity, critical thinking, collaboration, communication skills. Now, uh, more recently, if you look at the um, the, uh, the education literatures and um, yeah, some uh, and if you go to some education talks, conferences, then you see that people are also emphasizing something like this: grit, um, self-regulation when you are learning, uh, resilience, risk-taking, role mindset, etc. So, um, okay, previously we emphasized on knowledge. This is our old traditional classroom te teaching. But now, actually, we are talking about skills and also mindset. So why is that the case? Okay. Well, this is um, my, my, uh, my interpretation of what is happening uh, in the world. Now, basically, at 20th century and before, Knowledge is no longer the most difficult to obtain asset for a large population of human beings in education. Actually, most of our students, if you look at our students in Hong Kong, in high school or in universities, they have no difficulty assessing the, the most frontier knowledge. The problem is how do you deal with this knowledge? How, you, how do you deal with these things that is in front of you? So actually, that is, um, the, the question is whether human beings have the right skills and mindset to use this knowledge defines whether an education system is successful. I think this is the key message in, of 21st century education. Actually, if you look at many of the recent um, uh, publications um, or people, what people talk about, even in the age of the, of the AI in education, people are talking about, well, actually, we are not just talking about technology, but how do you use this technology to nurture people? That is because now we have to nurture our, our young generation so that they have the proper skills and mindset to use all this knowledge which is surrounding them. So this is a new focus in education. So we have to understand what motivates human beings to learn. Right? Uh, how human beings learn, what are the most significant barriers to human beings, uh, human learning uh, and creativity. In fact, these questions has been, educate, uh, has been addressed by the educators uh, in the last 20 years, and there are lots of publications on these topics. So let me just share with you a little bit of uh, what, I, what I learned. Okay. Now, uh, first of all, um, if you look at the education literature nowadays, um, they basically divide the skills about learning into two kinds of skills. Well, you can have more divisions, but let me just do this most uh, simple division. The cognitive skills versus the non-cognitive skills. Cognitive skills are those skills that we usually learn in classroom traditionally. So they are those skills your, your brain used to think, to read, to learn, to remember, uh, reason, and pay attention. So this is what you need when you are learning some new, new knowledge, when you are reading text, textbooks, when you are doing homeworks. Uh, they take uh, incoming information and move it into the band of knowledge you use at school, at work, and in life. So this is usually what uh, education is about. But actually, if you think about it, uh, in our daily life, there are many things that we do which are not depending on these skills, and they are actually equally important. For example, the fact that I'm standing here 
automatically pick up this microphone and then, uh, and then give this talk. It's actually not some, not some skill that you learned uh, in textbooks. You have to pick out by, by yourself somewhere. And the way that you walk, the way that you react to people's those are all skills that you pick up not from textbooks, from, but from experiences. And those are so-called non-cognitive skills. Well, uh, okay, this is how the people define it. This is a very long definition. Well, uh, they may be broadly defined as the personality trails or patterns of thought, feelings, and behavior. Um, well, psychologists classify non-cognitive skills in terms of uh, big five categories. Openness to experience, so how do you um, uh, deal with old, new experiences, conscientiousness, uh, extroversion, agreeableness, and neurotism. Okay. Well, educators tend to focus on skills that are more directly <clears throat> related to academic success. Well, even that, I mean, if you want to, have to succeed in academic, you need other skills. For example, academic behavior. Well, that is basically whether the students are going to class and is listening to lectures. That is actually something which affects how you learn. Uh, academic perseverance, uh, well, whether, well, when you're facing difficulty in class or in examination, how are you going to do with it? <clears throat> so these are mindsets. These are yeah, academic mindsets yeah, and many other things. Learning strategies, how do you deal with a, a textbook or, or lecture notes, things like that. Uh, so, so skills, of course, um, yeah, these are, this is, this are also important. So there are a number of different skills that fall within these this categories, known as non-cognitive skills. And these are actually now the, um, okay, well, the next slide, maybe. Okay, so first of all, let me show you some research results. Uh, well, this is some, something which is uh, not very, not really new. Well, this is a port of um, IQ. This is IQ. And this is uh, the measuring the achievement, which is basically measured by the salary of the, of the people at a certain age, okay, or whatever that is. Well, the point is that, well, you see, definitely IQ is related to how much you earn. But that relation is not so, uh, uh, it's not so, uh, not so monotonic, not so well-defined. You see, there's a very wild spread here. Even for the same IQ, whether you are successful can have a very large range. And if you look at one whatever achievement, the range of IQ that is being covered by this particular achievement is very wide, from let's say 120 to 70. So actually, you see, high IQ is, well, is helpful, but not that important. Um, actually, even if you look at, this is another a similar um, uh, port, which is the average SAT score uh, in the United States. Again, this is salary at a particular age. And you see also there is a similar pattern. Well, you, you may think that this is more flat, but this is the problem of scale. But anyway, the point is that, um, you see, um, these are uh, SAT score or IQ are believed to measure the cognitive skills. But the point is that besides the cognitive skill, there are lots of other factors which affect whether you are successful. That's the, the main message. Okay, so how does the brain work in this case? Well, there's a, a, a popular model um, called the two train model. Uh, basically, uh, I think if you read this book by, by Daniel Kahneman, who is a Nobel Prize laureate, um, okay, it's basically about the so-called two track model of how thinking, how humans think. Um, one is so-called the fast track and this, the other is the slow track. The idea, okay, very rough idea is that actually um, our brain, most of our, our everyday life, uh, reactions to surroundings, most of what we did, is actually controlled by so-called fast, fast-track brain. Well, because in everyday life, we have to have very fast response, response to surroundings. Uh, this response are sort of automatic. You don't have to think about it. Uh, you don't, therefore, it is considered to be uh, usually irrational, but crucial for survival, okay? Well, this is the, the kind of... Uh, uh, technique that we need for survival when we are, let's say, at uh, well, 50,000 years ago, when you're facing lion, tigers, and, and things like that. So this kind of fast-track brain govern most of the non-cognitive skills. And also, but uh, these skills are sometimes good, but they also have uh, some very bad effects on how we think. Um, this is something I think that um, many people know, that human beings have a bias 
in statistics. Uh, for example, when you are going to the casino, when you bet, when you are losing, then you, you try to stay longer, trying to win it back. But when you, when you, when you win, then you try to you know, just go away. So on average, you lose. Okay. So that's why. Okay. Uh, well, this also is low track brain, which is basically the part of the brain uh, doing, doing all this um, uh, analysis, analytical reasoning, knowledge, etc. But to process this information, to learn, um, it is a very slow process. So that is called the low, slow track of the brain. And the point is that in daily life, because our survival is, um, is mainly coming due to our fast brain. So when we are processing information, it's our fast brain which processes first, usually. So often they control the flow of information to the slow brain. Okay, so before you are, you are analyzing a problem, before you are trying to understand something, your fast brain tells you, well, maybe this is roughness, you should not spend any time on it, then you don't. But your fast brain, if you can control a fast brain such that your fast brain is welcoming you to learn this, then, okay, you have the motivation to learn. So the approval of the fast brain is crucial for learning of knowledge or cognitive skills. This is the main idea of this two-track model. Um, the problem is that um, if you want to train our fast brain so that it reacts in the way that we want, actually it's not so easy because it's our experience, educators, um, teaching for so many years, we will know that actually uh, if you try to train human all this automatic behavior, it, it, doesn't, it, it cannot be changed by just telling you what to do in the classroom. You have to have a very long, long term supportive environment to, uh, to, tune your, to tune your fast brain. So this is what we need. Uh, it, it's not something that can be taught immediately in the classroom. So for example, uh, this is one example which has often come up when people study creativity, which is actually uh, why children become less creative when they grow up. This is a very general phenomenon. People, the, the, the babies, the very young babies are more creative. But when they are gradually growing up, then because of the environment, they become less creative. Okay, so this is one problem. Now then, uh, that we have to, uh, to address when we are uh, nurturing our young generation. Now, the other problem, which I think most of the people here is aware of, is the rise of STEM. So we generally believe that the rapid advance in technology in the past 50 years have brought huge changes to human society, and these changes will be even faster in the coming, uh, coming decades. Um, so the problem is that in the education sector, is that the knowledge we learned at schools and universities are becoming outdated very rapidly. Now, the problem that um, we are facing, that means we, in, in principle, we have to be able to teach at schools in a way that um, the knowledge is uh, updated quite frequently. Let's say maybe every 10 years, we have to change our curriculum or something like that. But, um, so this is how we can do that. How can we teach at schools if the teaching materials have to be updated every few years? How can we build a, responding, a corresponding examination system? Which I think if you, well, okay, uh, we are in Hong Kong, so we know how difficult it is to change the examination system. And how do we do, well, the other very, actually this is also very difficult. How can we do teacher's knowledge upgrade? If you have worked with uh, uh, training teachers, we will see how, how difficult it is. Uh, I have, yes, I have, so I know how difficult it is. Okay. Well, these changes actually are not restricted to just scientific or STEM subjects because the STEM is affecting many other areas of knowledge, affecting the whole society. So actually, change is actually much larger than we uh, naively expect. Okay. Well, um, so this is our real problem. It's, difficulty, it's difficult for our school or university system to change rapidly. Well, this is a worldwide problem, not just in Hong Kong. In fact, if you're not with educators in UK and United States, they'll say the same problem. So what can do, we do realistically? Well, as far as I know, there are only basically two kinds of proposal. The first proposal is actually we try to, um, well, we, we try not to be so aggressive. We try to test run our programs in some spe a selected class of students first. Okay, well, uh, that would be easier. 
we just restrict ourselves to some students who are willing to change, to some teachers who are willing to change. So these are um, a special STEM school. And in Hong Kong, it is us, HKAGE, the Hong Kong Academy for Gift Education, which is what, well, which is what we are. And the other thing is to in introduce all this new teaching or learning methodology. Um, well, uh, for you, the, the, the basic idea is that, well, students have to learn by themselves uh, all these new knowledges, and teachers become facilitators. Uh, this is, in principle, I think, okay, but uh, it's very difficult to, to implement. Okay, so this is what we are doing in HKGE. Uh, first of all, we take all these non-cognitive skills very seriously by building uh, on a supportive environment for students that supports both their non-cognitive and cognitive needs. Okay? And okay, I'm going to tell you how we do it. And also, uh, as far as addressing the second challenge, as I've told you, we are a kind of special school. We are nurturing a very small number of students in Hong Kong. Well, uh, uh, currently we have something like, uh, I think 6,000 something uh, student members, so it's not too bad. Uh, we work closely with the frontline uh, scientists like the, um, the Young Academy of Science. Uh, also, we work with engineers, bankers, politicians, educators, both locally and worldwide to build our programs. This is actually what we are doing. Okay, so this is how our, well, this is just one slide summarizing the structure of, of our program. Um, first of all, the fundamental part of our education program, which is basically for primary school students, is so-called affective education. Affective education is the more, um, you, know, like, you may say, the emotional part of the non-cognitive education. So this is about understanding yourself. The students have to understand, understand themselves, find their interests, and develop a growth mindset to deal with whatever ahead of them. So, um, yeah, at very early age, it's a primary, primary school. So we require all our students to at least participate in some effective education program. And afterward, uh, we have these academic programs, which is trying to give the students opportunity to have an in-depth development in an area of their interest. Uh, this is learning of knowledge and um, the so-called cognitive skill. Usually, these are the, for the stu uh, student in the junior secondary uh, 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 time. Um, yeah, it's, it's actually nowadays, this is not the difficult part. This is the easy part. Many people are willing to help. And then the last part is the advanced learning experiences. Well, these are, we are trying to, um, to build individualized programs for those students who are really interested at, um, at going far beyond uh, the normal high school. Okay. Uh, I think this is the easiest way to put it. So, for example, they want to challenge themselves, become scientists, become um, politicians, maybe, I don't know. Okay. So, we, um, so we organize mentorship programs for these students or any other uh, individualized experience for them. Um, so this is non-cognitive and cognitive skills working together. This is for senior secondary school students. So this is the model that we are working on. And I hope that, um, okay, in the future, the members of the Young Academy of Science can help us in this one and, and of course. All right, so lastly, let me just show you one thing, one slide. Yeah, we have some su successful examples. Yeah, um, yeah, okay, I'm not going to tell you this example. Oh, one, okay. Uh, this is the thing that I want to show you. Um, this is um, Torrance Manifesto for Children. Torrance is the people who invent, uh, sort of the, the people invented the first creativity test for, 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 uh, for, 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 uh, for children. So that is the, uh, they say, so-called talent test for creativity. TT test for yeah, FC or something like that. And at the, at the end of his life, well, very late years, he wrote down this. Um, is ex the expectation what we have to do for students. I think this is still something which is um, 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 it's still something that we have to do nowadays. So I just put it in. And I think I also put this in, uh, in the doors of, in some of the doors in, in HKG. Right. So yeah, enjoy it. Thank you very much. <laughs>